So, the sovereignty of God and the sovereignty of man, God's infinitely sovereign, man is finitely sovereign, but each has their own sovereignty involved in man's, an individual man's salvation. Here's compare, I just spoke about this this morning. Compare Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Before the foundation of the world, before you and I actually existed, these are his actions. Notice that God foreknew, therefore he predestined, and thus he called, ekalese, which means, or translated, elected, resulting in justification and glorification. And we're justified, we believers now, up to this point in time. And those who believe, in the future times, after the rapture, millennial rule, they're also justified before the foundation of the world. And we were, will have a future glorification. Man's free will decision to believe or not believe unto eternal life is not in this equation. From man's point of view, it is. Man is sovereign over what he chooses to do by his will and chooses not to do by his will. Yet, this is all already predestined before the foundation of the world. This is a sad thing because, and it's an awesome thing, scary awesome. I did nothing. I, I felt like I chose to believe when I was 17. I felt pretty good about it. But you chose of your own volition. I chose of my own volition to believe. But God predestined me to choose of my own volition to believe. So the not elect, those who are not predestined to believe, will inevitably not believe. They'll inevitably not choose to believe. Compare 1 Peter 2, 7 to 8. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. Disobey, which would mean don't believe. How do you uh, obey the message? The message is to believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one only Son. That's the message. That whoever believes in him should never perish but have everlasting life. If you disobey that message, you decide not to believe. This is also what they were destined for. So in a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall, they stumble because they disobey, don't believe the message, which is also what they were destined for, predestinated. I am so sad, I'm so glad that I'm saved, but and, and I'm recognizing how gracious God is for allowing me to choose to believe and electing me, persuading me, drawing me to that faith to work against my will, which is naturally not to believe. But somehow, God drew me. No one can come to the Father, no one can come to Christ by faith unless the Father draws him. Somehow I got drawn. Then I chose to believe. I got drawn. But I was predestined to be drawn. 
and I was predestined to choose to believe as a result of that drawing. And you, you might ask, well, what suppose God draws somebody in the same manner and they choose not to believe? Well, the interesting thing about that is that Jesus declared no one can come to him by faith unless the Father draws him. So that would presume that if the Father draws him, he'll come to by faith. Because otherwise, it would deteriorate into circular reasoning nonsense. So notice that those who disobey, i.e. refuse to believe the message of the gospel, and thereby stumble, were destined, i.e. decreed, for this to happen by God. All individuals have this incapacity to obey the message of the gospel. That's you and I. Romans 8, 7. Elect and not elect alike. And therefore, all individuals stumble over the message of faith alone and Christ alone. The stumbling block, until some, the elect, are provided with God's election work, where they are drawn by the Son, by the Father, as I was mentioning, John 6.44. The avail, hiding and understanding of the gospel, is taken away. 2 Corinthians 3.16 and 4.3-4. All right. Let's take a look at these little uh, verses, John 6.44. I always like to take a look at these because I've studied the Bible for so many years, I forget a lot of stuff. John 6.44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Let's back up a little bit. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is this, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? That presents him as being God. Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. They just wouldn't believe. Miraculous performance. Scripture supports this Jesus. That they were, they, they were viewing him right now, but they did not believe. And Jesus said, well, unless the Father sent me, who sent me, draws him. Now he's declaring, the Father sent me from heaven. And he's going to also draw those who uh, would then be convinced of their own volition and believe. Come to me means to believe him. Amazing. 2 Corinthians 3.16 Always look these up passages just to, to verify your understanding of them and don't miss another a review. But to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. That's part of the drawing. The veil, the, the hidden actual truth of Christ dying for our sins, is taken away. It's no longer hidden. Because the man's volition will refuse to believe until that veil is taken away. That's what God's drawing is all about. How does he work on your volition? Doesn't force you to believe, but persuades you to believe. How about 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4? And even if our gospel is veiled, there's that veiled again, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. They're not elect. The minds are blinded. Well, I was elect when I was 17, when I was 16, when I was 15, 14, before that, I was elect. But my mind, my volition, was dead set against not deciding to believe or not being concerned with it. Sometimes I went to church, uh, the uh, Dutch Reformed Church in Douglaston, uh, Long Island, New York. And uh, I just went and did what they told me to do. And nobody presented the gospel to me. Kind of uh, informational stuff that I memorized. And when I uh, re 
answered their questions properly, I became a member of the church. Not once was the gospel presented. And not once did I see that there was something missing. So, they are drawn to the Son by the Father, John 6, 44. The veil hidden by an understanding, hiding and understanding the gospel is taken away. And they are provided with the gift of faith, Philippians 1, 29. Interesting, I have people ask me this question, Philippians 1, 29. Well, if you're giving you the gift of faith, that means you're kind of forced to believe. No, because by definition, believing or having faith in something <coughs> is of the nature of man's volition. Somehow there's a gift, though. God persuades the man to choose to reject, not to, uh, to not reject, but accept what Christ did for them on the cross. That's the key. That is a gift God gave that individual. He gave you and me. All of a sudden, it was a piece of cake to believe when I was 17. So you were granted the gift of faith in the sense of now, of your own volition, you chose, you were persuaded, you chose to believe in Jesus. At which time they inevitably, trust alone and Christ alone, of their own volition, and are saved as decreed by God from the foundation of the universe. Compare Romans 9, 19 to 22. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? Well, the problem with that is, he's not forcing you to believe. But who are you, O man, Paul writes, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him, who formed it, the world, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for dishonor? You and I were made for noble purposes, albeit. Did we deserve it? No. We chose to believe our own volition, but with the gift of faith, and but with the election, but with the persuasion, but with the drawing. The word dishonor means vileness, points to those who are destined to God's eternal wrath and condemnation. The question in verse 22 is then asked, what if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction. Notice that those who are destined for the lake of fire were made out of the same lump of clay of humanity for dishonor, in other words, for the purpose of condemnation. Oh, I shudder to think that could have been me, but by the grace of God, it, unfathomable that he chose me and I then chose to believe in his son. They were prepared for destruction, although they indeed do have the opportunity to believe and be saved. John 3.16, God so loved the world. They evidently were not elect, so they are on their own as to the choice to ch trust in Christ or not. They were thus created for dishonor and prepared for destruction, such that they inevitably will disobey the message of the gospel in the sense that they will choose of their own volition to never trust in Christ as Savior and suffer eternal condemnation. Point five. Predestination. That end which is determined beforehand by God to which those who have been elected are set apart as part of God's overall and foreordained plan. He didn't look down into a lady talked to me today in the pool about this. He doesn't look down in the future. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen. Yes, he looks in the future. He can do that. But he's already decreed what's going to happen. So he didn't have to look in the future to see what man will do. He's not then totally sovereign, is he? Well, I'm going to wait to see what men do. And those that, uh, that will choose to believe in the future, uh, way back into, uh, forward into the centuries, then I'll, I'll say, well, I've elected him. Isn't that putting the cart before the horse? That's 